Maybe I could start by asking you a question. When did you start the Ragged University? How old is it? Oh, well, I started uh, the Ragged University um, about five years ago, just over five years ago, because a friend got in touch and said, would I help a, a community organization called Street Performers Community Organization in Hackney Marshes? And I, I said yes. I went down. I helped help do sort of back accounts, organize our office, uh, do what I could, and they they found it useful. They asked me how would I bring community together and improve everybody's lives. I said I don't know. I came back to Edinburgh. I asked everybody I could and two friends who were retired educators said, well, the ragged schools is a really monumental movement. Uh, it built the infrastructure of, of the UK. Mm. And I looked into that history, saw that it was uh, about social support and uh, communities coming together to share their knowledge, share their skills. And that uh, it showed good practice to the government of its time. And in 1870, the government was so impressed, it absorbed the infrastructure the communities had built. 1870? 1870. Which goes back quite a way. Yes. Uh, that was the first Education Act, the Forster Education Act. Oh, right. So I, I believe we can do this again with higher education uh, and uh, I, I can send you links to, to the, the history of the ragged school. Oh, I'd love that. Please. Yeah. Okay, so let me give you a little history about myself. Um, I studied in school in Karachi uh, and then I came to the UK uh, to study architecture and I went to uh, a school of environmental studies. I was very interested in the whole concept of environment. Environment taken as a holistic uh, word, not only just the built environment, but the natural environment too. But the two are really part and parcel of how uh, human beings live, or can live, should live. Um, and then I, was, I lived uh, here in uh, the UK for, well, in Scotland for 27 years and left in 1990, I went back to Pakistan. There were two reasons for that. One was that the recession had uh, been pretty heavy in the 80s, late 80s, and uh, our practice was uh, almost uh, architectural practice, which we had in uh, in Treedale Court in the old, old time over here. Uh, it was... Um, it was almost closed because we just weren't getting any work and we were owed so much money by various other people. So I just decided for a break and I went back to Pakistan and I started my practice there. In the process of traveling in the country, um, I discovered that uh, there was more poverty than I realized or had actually given myself an opportunity to observe. By the way, prior to that, I'd worked for the British government in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, um, looking at rural development. And that was where my interest started with rural development. That program was for three years. Um, and then in Pakistan, I established our uh, NGO called Indusar Trust in the year 2000. And um, from the very beginning, because I've all, already had been experienced a certain aspect of um, rural development from the donor side, because that's what I was. I was working for the British government at the time. Um, I realized that really uh, this piecemeal approach towards alleviation of poverty will never alleviate poverty. It will just carry on ad infinitum. The people, the one person that can step outside the poverty ladder is the person themselves. Uh, all they need is direction. 
because they are, I'm talking about Pakistan now, they are uneducated. And they need uh, a step up. Um, and they need um, the initial uh, approach to allow them to do a business. We have 1,250 people uh, with whom we are doing what we call livelihood options. And they are now uh, all earning substantial amount of money. They were really at the point of begging, but now they're earning their own, they built their own houses, they're sending their children to a private school. They've, um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's an, and I think I sent you an e email uh, video that you've seen of one lady who's really broken the, the um, poverty cycle for herself. And she's now, I go and visit her from time to time, and she's, she and her husband and her children are really doing very well. My approach has been from the very beginning, and I call it integrated development. I look at my life. I have a house, I have electricity, I have water. I have a road that gets me to my house. Uh, I have a community that I live in. Um, there are trees. <coughs> Excuse me. There are trees around where I live. Most of them planted by myself. Um, I have access to health when I need. And there is uh, schools and universities that people have access to. In other words, integrated development means, means that you have to provide all of that to one person. And only then will that one person be able to move out of the poverty cycle. So when you go into the villages in Pakistan, the first thing that strikes you is, is the type of houses that they live in, which is mostly made out of straw or mud. Um, and then you look inside and you see that they have very little facilities, basic facilities. The women and children, girls mostly, walk miles to collect water and to get firewood for cooking. Um, these are basic facilities. There's no electricity. So at night, they walk around with lanterns, kerosene lanterns. And kerosene lanterns are very uh, dangerous. A, if it falls over and it's set many houses, and killed many people uh, on fire. Uh, plus the fact that it gives a not a very pleasant smell and you know it affects your lungs after some time. All of these things were part and parcel of our approach. And it's taken almost 14 years to get to where we are at this moment in time, where some people are beginning to listen to this aspect. And uh, I'm very keen to uh, promote this to the World Bank. And I've done that. I made three presentations to them over the last, oh, this year, in fact. Um, no, starting from September to now. Um, but really, it's not just, it's not just convincing donors. It's convinc convincing all of us. But what we need to do is to, if we're interested in development, and why are we interested in development? What's the point? Why not just carry on with your life and just leave the rest to do whatever they have to do? And there are two reasons that I'm, I'm doing this, and this is selfish reasons. One is that I believe that uh, inequality is one of the greatest dangers to our communities uh, at this moment in time. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the, you know, the, the gap is getting larger and larger. Secondly, I believe that if you were to provide the lower strata, and I'll use that word because I can't think of anything else, um, with the facilities to increase their um, standard of life, and by standard of life, I don't mean you go out and buy a fridge or a TV. You know, we're, we're not reaching that stage. We're reaching a stage where we talk about health, that at least you get three meals a day, 
so that you have proper nutrition, that your children or the, the young children are, are breastfed and not uh, proposed by the advertisements that milk should be powdered and you can get it best from that. Breastfeeding has been one of the reasons, sorry, the lack of breastfeeding, one of the reasons why a lot of the children in the, that part of the world are stunted. Is, you know, just just to flesh that out a bit, uh, is, is there heavy advertisement from companies, uh, powdered milk companies there? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to be jumping up and down. Um, like, yeah. I'll give you this, this uh, advertisements I've gone on for hybrid seeds for farmers. Um, once you get caught in that trap, you're forever in that trap. Because what happens is that you buy the sack of seeds in a shop. Say I buy it from you. And uh, I can't afford to give you the full cost of it. But what the deal is that you take 30% or 50% of the produce at the end of the day. And so when my produce is made, and I'm making rice, uh, I have to give you 50% of those, that profit of rice. But because I've only done 50% of it, not 100% of it, I'm beholden to you to get another sack of rice, hybrid seed. And that circle continues, that owing the debt system is very prevalent in, in Pakistan. Actually, it's not only this uh, Pakistan, it's the whole world. The whole world uh, actually believes that and works to that effect. Um, um, what's a book that was written uh, about how the United States makes sure that uh, certain third world countries forever remain in debt? Because if they remain in debt, they, they are beholden to them. It wouldn't be Joseph Steiglitz. Um, I know he writes quite a lot, about, but I'm interested. It'll, it'll, to it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. So that that debt is is there. It's in India too. In India, your farmers are in debt all the time because of they can't afford the, the the system. They can't afford to work within the system. And the same in Pakistan. It's the same situation. So to answer your question about powdered milk. It's, there are two reasons why the, 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 uh, the poor keep powdered milk. One, it's, it, you can preserve it, keep it for a long time. And all you need to do is, you know, is add water. Fresh milk needs to be kept cool. Um, and to keep it cool is an uphill task. Uh, there are no fridges, so water is used. Others, other elements are used by Hessian sacks are placed over the milk and that is kept damp so that the temperature, but it can only stay for a day at the very most two days. I mean, at the moment, average summer temperatures in Pakistan are from 30 to 45 degrees centigrade. And at the moment, you perhaps have already read in the papers that uh, there is a huge heat wave going on in Pakistan, um, where nearly a thousand people have died through the heat, a drought. That has happened. And the same happened in India a few months ago. So these climate change issues are now becoming more and more prevalent. Um, so the poor are, are always caught in this cycle of how to keep things and what is the cheapest way of getting something. So going back to the milk, I'll give you an example. We made a proposal um, where we said that what to the donor, that we would provide uh, uh, a family with five, four goats. And they, they'd be kids. So when they grew up, they could sell three, but they had to keep one. That was the deal. And the goat that was kept had to produce milk. A goat's milk is very, uh, very rich and excellent for mother to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that breastfeeding would then st stop the stunting of the young child who it's in the first year that actually that stunting uh, develops in, in children in that part of the world. 
So, but we weren't successful in getting that uh, particular proposal. I thought it was a good proposal, but that's the way it goes. You make proposals, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Um, so having done uh, this type of research about integrated development, we said that the first thing we should provide is clean drinking water, because that leads to, removes a lot of ill health in, uh, in the human being, especially children. So that is what we started by providing a basic uh, facility of clean drinking water. The second item on our list was light, to provide light at night, so that uh, at night they could do their chores as opposed to doing their chores in the middle of the day when it's hot, um, read, and generally increase their income by making things, you know, crafts or whatever it was. Now, if you can imagine, uh, Alex, if you lived in a in a village where your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents had never actually seen light at night, all they'd seen was candle or uh, kerosene, and then all of a sudden you were given a light. And we use solar power for lighting and solar and wind. Uh, can you imagine what the psychological effect it would have on you? And I've tried to put myself in that in their position, and I and I come, I've come to the conclusion that the one thing that would have changed my whole perspective was the fact that I could see at night, um, that I could go to the toilet with a lantern uh, instead of fumbling around in the dark, because the toilets are built outside the houses; they're not in the houses. Um, all of those things would have given me a lot of hope. And we've, we've electrified quite a few villages. I've, I've got my brochures and things, which I can give you a copy now or uh, at the time to talk, um, which gives the numbers. The second most important thing was sanitation. Third, sorry, sanitation. Uh, because defecating out in the open led to various other issues of disease, etc. Uh, the soil was getting, um, um, polluted, and then that pollution would be going into the streams and etc. So, sanitation was a we we were building latrines, pit latrines. But over the last three years, uh, we're concentrating on livelihoods, and livelihoods means that we ascertain an individual. And they seventy percent of them are women. They are more reliable, and they work harder than the men do. Um, so, if a woman wants to set up a uh, a sewing machine um, facility where she can make clothes to sell, then we provide her with a sewing machine. We also give her uh, lessons; it can last about a week, or maybe sometimes even longer on how to improve sewing techniques. Then we teach the person how to keep books, how to run a business, um, how to be competitive, where to buy the cloth, what type of cloth and what you cost and what you charge. All of this takes about three to four months. Um, if you want to start a confectionery shop or a vegetable shop, um, we then take them to the market, the main. I mean, one of the first women that we started with a vegetable store, she'd never been to the main market where wholesale vegetables are sold. And we took her there, showed her how to bargain, um, uh, what were the techniques of bargaining, and how much to buy so that whenever she brought it to the village, it would last long enough for it to, without it going bad. Uh, keeping books, running a business really was the target. Now we have a center, which we call the Mehran Center, where we train people, skill, provide skills, um, simple skills like learning how to drive a car. So you can be a chauffeur for somebody or uh, how to be a, a maid in a, in a hotel. What are the things that are required of you? Uh, just to be a maid, you know, to look after rooms and things like that. 
Um, so it's it's not this sort of skill development which is at a high level, or if you like, in the middle level. We are right at the bottom level, showing people because these people are a they're uneducated, uh, most of them are, um, and also to it would be outside their intellectual capacity to cope with things which are they would feel uncomfortable with. Although I'm, I'm, I imagine that there's there's a lot of vernacular and traditional knowledge. Oh yes, uh, there must be gold mines. So, absolutely, uh, uh, which, absolutely, which I'm particularly interested in. So you know, uh, Alex, we build houses for people, and we use earth and bamboo as material. These uh, this technique has been there for hundreds of years. We're not inventing something new. We're just going back to show people that instead of using concrete blocks, which is what you aspire for, uh, there are other ways that your forefathers built. <laughs> and that method of that technique, if you do it properly, will last you 50 years, 60 years. Plus the fact that it'll be cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, this type of uh, building technique, as opposed to using concrete and tin roofs and things like that. And slowly people are beginning to understand that. We, we, we've got, I think we're building about 200 houses now, up to. But every time we build something, like we're doing a project in uh, Balochistan, where we've got to build 50 houses. And what we've done, we brought the masons and the carpenters to our training center. And they spent two weeks there. And we trained them how to build a house. Excuse me, and they've gone back, and now they're building the houses themselves. We're not there at all. So what we've done is provided a skill to, excuse me, about eight masons, and I think four carpenters, um, in this technique of building, using earth and bamboo as a material. And it's, we've built now 20 of these houses, or 50. First, at the first time, people were saying, you know, why are you wasting your money? Uh, you these things won't last, etc., uh, etc. Et but there have been two very heavy rains. None of the buildings have collapsed, um, and the people that are living in them, you know, the walls are a good uh, three to three hundred fifty millimeters thick. Um, they find it extremely cool, as opposed to some of the concrete houses that they've been living in before, which collapsed because an earthquake had taken place in October last year, in this particular location. So these are resistant to earth, a certain amount of yeah. earth tremor? Yeah. What we've done is we, I was trained in, in France and in Japan in um, uh, earthquake resistant houses, how to build earthquake resistant houses. Now, if I can just explain very briefly, uh, an earthquake, uh, when it happens, it releases a lot of energy and that energy goes upwards and it goes sideways, both ways. So what the technique that we do is to build gabions. Like, you, you know what a gabion is. No. It's, it's round rocks in, encased in uh, wire mesh. Right. So the round rocks, because they're round, are able to move when an earthquake takes place. And it absorbs all the energy from the ground before it affects the building structure itself. So, yeah. and it works, it yeah. works very well. And it's a very simple technique. And the, <laughs> the bamboo and the earth that's on top of all this is lightweight enough to be able to uh, withstand this energy. But most of the energy has been taken up with the foundations because that's where they, the gabions have been built. Um, and in worst case scenario, if the building collapses, you won't die. 90% of the people that were killed in earthquakes was because the building was made of concrete and collapsed on top of them before they were able to get out. But because this is lightweight, you'll get injured, but you won't kill you. I mean, it will hurt you, but it won't kill you if the roof collapses. And that's the worst case scenario. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the way that we do housing. Uh, everything that we do, we teach them how to do it firstly. Like uh, if it's a question of uh, a solar powered a lighting system, we show them how to make the solar power, solar uh, the solar panels, and they make the solar panels. They 
Some of them have started a business selling solar lanterns. Um, some of them actually are in the process of creating the business where they rent out some of the uh, materials that they have. Um, and that's in a nutshell what integrated development is. So coming back to development, what I've seen over these last 15 years personally, international donors come uh, to Pakistan at times when the floods have taken place or earthquakes have happened um, or drought or whatever reason, the international donors have their own agenda and they come to a place. But quite honestly, uh, I'm more or less firmly of the view that they shouldn't come at all um, because they don't know the culture. They don't understand the people. They don't understand the way of the life of the people. I'll give you an example. A German from a very well-known German donor organization came. I was checking out the work that we were doing and we were working, walking through a village where the women were planting uh, rice. And his first comment was slave labor. And I pointed out to him, I said, no, this is not slave labor. This is their culture. This is the way that the women, they plant the seed. And when the seed is fulfilled and the rice is up, then the men go and harvest it. Uh, that was just as a point to say that he obviously had no idea what was in his mind was um, slave labor, which is putting women to work and there were no men there. But he didn't understand that this is part of the culture. And this goes on and on all the time. There's no dignity in it. Mm. You know, when you hand out money to somebody and or you hand out, you give a handout, the person that is receiving it receives it because he or she has no choice. But you know, these people are very proud and they, they respect someone who helps them with a, with a process of uh, providing dignity to their plight, if that's the word to use. Um, and that is what we call us, we, that is our, our vision, if you like, is development with dignity. What is happening in the development world is exactly what I've been saying is that uh, there has to be a paradigm shift in attitude, both from the donor and the donee. Uh, in the sense that it, there's no longer uh, possible for me to come and build your house and then you move in free of charge. You have to do it yourself. Um, in our work, we insist that every community gives 20%, either in cash or in labor. Ownership is very important for it to be sustainable. Without any ownership, then if something is given to you free, you, you, you just wouldn't care for it, would you? You just say, okay, fine, it's gone. I'll wait till the next one comes. And that's what's been happening over the years. Ever since the Second World War, that's been going on. And that approach has to change completely. When it comes to growth, the whole notion of growth, that unless you provide a growth cent, uh, percentage for 2% or 4% or 5% or whatever the figure is, GDP, um, the, the, the society will start to stagnate. This is the, the perception when before our environment was being affected and before climate change had become an issue, which now is without any doubt is uh, overtaking our lives. And I fear that in some situations, the, the climate change has gone past the point of no return. Um, from what I read, from my research, I understand that the two degrees uh, increase in Earth's temperature is now more or less certain. And, sorry. Did you... Yeah, um, so you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you're, you're noticing uh, problems. I mean, are you witnessing over over your 
uh, over time with your own eyes certain effects on the environment, be it loss of biodiversity, be it, uh, I don't know, what, what, what are your observations? I'm, I'm interested to know. In Pakistan, we have a tree cover, forest cover 2.5%, and it should be 22%. So when the floods came, and the floods came from the north, from the mountains, there was no tree cover to keep the water uh, or to prevent the water from becoming a flood. Uh, and then it became flood and there was huge devastation, billions of uh, dollars worth of damage was done. Uh, this I've witnessed. Um, drought, which is happening now, I've witnessed drought, both in certain desert areas where people are, are dying, animals are dying, um, through lack of proper nutrition, lack of water, um, and recently here in uh, in Karachi, before I left, it was 38 degrees with a 75 percent percentage of humidity. So it's almost impossible to work a good 10 to 12 hour day. Um, I've worked in temperatures where it's been 48, and the only way that you can work is you start at about four in the morning or five depending on when the sun rises and the location that you're in. And after nine, you can't work. And then you have to then work uh, from about six in the evening till about nine at night. Um, in, in between, you, you just have to stay in the shade. But it's very debilitating. It kind of takes out, takes out most of the energy. I've, yeah, I've personally experienced drought and floods. Sea level rise uh, in certain parts of the coastline in Pakistan. Thousands of hectares of land have been taken over by the sea. The sea is rising in that part of the world. It may not be rising in other parts of the world, but certainly there we've lost agricultural land to sea level rise. Uh, so there, there are three things that I've personally seen uh, happening. Um, Going back to the whole notion of growth, I'm talking about a paradigm shift, I think we have to move away from the Keynesian economics uh, of old, just a century and a half old. We now have to move into an economics which is based on our environment and based on carbon footprints. The minimum carbon footprints, you get more maximum of, uh, awards for or reward or whatever it is. Uh, if it's not based on the environment and if it's not given the climate change is not given the credibility that it needs to be given by heavy industries, cement industry, the oil industry, um, eventually it will lead to their demise. Ours, yours and mine, will, we will have demise a long time ago, but they will be affected by it because the natural resources run out. There is no more lime. There is what? What was I reading the other day in the New Scientist? Um, uh, cadmium. Mineral cadmium is only about seven years left for it. Uh, some of the um, um, gypsum, 15 years. Uh, I'll try and remember all these figures. Um, I've got them in my computer. Um, it's all, it's all coming to a point where you're going to have to start saying, well, I don't have this material. I don't, I, I don't have the rare earth to put my screen in, in one of these things, you know? Uh, so what are we going to do? And now, up to now, everybody's saying, oh, it's not my problem. It'll get sorted out. Uh, and it's not as bad as it's made out to be. Um, the scientists will do something. The technologists will do something. But everybody requires, whether it's science or technology, you're going to require resources, mineral resources, the Earth's resources. And they are slowly coming to a standstill. There are many still available. Coal is still available. Oil is still available. But it's doing huge damage to the atmosphere. And if we don't take cognizance of this, the growth industry, which keeps talking about growth, because that's the way that you get 
the IMF, the World Bank, to understand that because it's a growth sorry, because it's a growth um, attitude that we just carry on saying that we'll grow. So we'll build more industries, we'll build more cement plants, we'll do whatever it is we can with oil. And we forget the, the environment. Now, Pakistan has got, has been projected to have a 4.2% growth rate uh, in 2015, 2016. The World Bank came out with a report saying that environmental degradation has cost Pakistan's GDP 3.8%. So actually, the only growth that is happening in Pakistan is 0.6%. But politicians obviously are totally ignoring it. Um, and why is the environment uh, being so badly affected? It's because it's being decimated. Corruption is so endemic in Pakistan that nobody really cares as long as I can make a fast buck the quick, you know, the earliest way possible. I've given lectures to industry, to factories, but they've just paid no attention. You know, it's just. Um, I don't know what else you would like me to talk about at this stage. Well, I'm interested to uh, how you see, how, how can we possibly approach uh, an alt what does an alternative economy look like? What does a sustainable economy look like or uh, an integrated landscape? So can you paint, paint that picture? There are people, uh, and, and I am a great admirer of Jeffrey Sachs. There are people who uh, are, are better uh, qualified to answer that question um, in the sense of what that economy might be. But let us look at just something simple like trees. If, if a community, at the end of the day, we are in the developing world, we are reliant on the developed world to provide funds for us to pull through the whole issue of the environment uh, degradation. We are reliable on that. We rely on that. Um, but the way that it is being uh, allocated by the West to the East, if I can use that word, uh, the developed and developing world is at the moment, not producing the sort of um, um, wealth of environmental um, improvement. What it's doing is giving money to governments. And you plant a million trees. The government doesn't plant a million trees. The government plants 200,000 trees. And the rest of the money is eaten away. Um, what I'm saying to donors, what I want to say to donors is that that's not what you should be doing. What you should be doing is to say that, look, if you plant a million trees, our uh, approach towards funding you will have more brownie points, will be given more uh, credence and credibility if you do this. If we don't do this, then we'll, we'll, we'll slowly withdraw our support systems toward, to you. Now, Indonesia is a classic example where they're burning forests left, right, and center, Brazil, etc. And it starts, some, somehow or the other, it's being sustained in Brazil. What we have to also get across to people now is the meat industry. But you know, uh, what is happening for you to have your hamburger is there is a whole roast of effects. It takes 20 tons of water to make one kilogram of coffee. 20 tons of water. Now that's the whole process of making coffee, uh, one, one, one kilogram of coffee. Um, there are other things that have been mentioned by many people about how uh, the way that we've been doing things is really not acceptable anymore. Um, if we want to save the planet, well, actually, 
The planet will be saved if we want to save ourselves. Planet will survive. It's going through the fifth, uh, so I read, the fifth, um, what is it? Uh, extinction. Extinction, yeah. And that's got nothing to do with uh, climate change or environmental degradation. It's just that it's happening. Uh, hundreds of species have disappeared, which should have taken 10,000 years. It's taken 20 years for them to disappear, extinct. So if we want to survive, and we have to learn that we need to be part of the ecosystem. The ecosystem keeps us alive. China is spending billions of dollars in pollinating their plants because they've killed off all their bees. And their bees uh, were killed off because of the heavy use of pesticide. Einstein made a very uh, uh, astute remark. He said, if all the bees were to die today, the human race will only last 20 years. Um, how does the economy work with the environment? It's to provide the incentive for people to improve the environment as opposed to degrade the environment, which means pollution, and especially the sea. The sea has to be uh, given cognizance of. It's, it's, it's being raped at an enormous rate at this moment in time by all, all the countries, you know, it's not just Japan or Korea or China, America, everybody's doing it. Scraping the bottom off. But that's the best I can say from my hmm. understanding, Alex. If, you, if you're looking for uh, uh, real quotes, then I or, or real um, um, uh, examples of how it could happen, then I can pick it out and present it on the 29th. Oh, it's very from others. Yeah, I mean, th this is a violent learning process, and what what uh, myself, uh, the community connecting through Ragged University, uh, Edinburgh can learn from what you're doing, from the people you're learning from, what what we can learn from Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not. I I don't ever see it as a one way process. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean these these are issues that. It, they, they're, we're tied, all tied into them. Hmm. Uh, uh, and I've been um, increasingly aware of this over time. Uh, so uh, recently there was a talk by Susan Brown, and she 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 was talking about the uh, Rockstrom's nine planetary boundaries, uh, and these are nine boundaries that that. And, and where we are on overstepping them, uh, we we need to, we need to realize that we're we're not sitting on an infinite pool of resources, mm. uh, which which is an infantile assumption. Mm. Uh, the the a society built on uh, redundancy, mm. on throwing away valuable resources. I was thinking today, uh, I was helping clear up a, an event and all of these j jam jars were being just thrown out. And I was, well, they weren't being thrown out, they were put, being put into recycling. And I thought, well, why are we even melting these down and recycling them? Mm -hmm. Why are we not just, why is there not a, a, a culture of putting jam back in them. In the, in the jam jars, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which used to be in the old days. Yeah. That's exactly what our parents used to do, or mothers used to do, is never to throw a jam jar away, you just make some more jam and put it back in the jam, in the in the jar. Yeah, uh, yeah quite, absolutely. Uh, but all this, is, it requires an attitude change. Uh, I think that's such a thing. Hi, Asha. Hey, hi, Good, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, come in. It's in. okay. It's okay. It's all informal. Okay. Hello, interview. <laughs> nice to see nice you. See you. Yeah. you made it here, okay? Didn't get yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Found it and Good. got in. And 
it took him a bit of time to come up because I think the bell wasn't ringing properly or, or oh, I was yeah, that's a, pressing it properly. That's why I kind of gave you quite a few instructions. People tend to wander around the building for a while and go, oh, I'm not sure. But yeah. Oh, the gate just, the buzzer didn't... Didn't work uh, properly. Yeah, you have to push it. Oh, you have to use force. <laughs> All right. I, Sometimes I, people don't even bother with the buzzer. It's just, you know, if you do force it, it just goes anyway. So. All right. I, I <laughs> always were weary about breaking something yeah you know, because yeah. yeah uh being a big laddie uh, i used to sort of go oh well it just needs a bit of force snap <laughs> no <laughs> a bit of finesse alex yeah <laughs> well i think you're probably a lot more thoughtful than most of the people that come in and out of this building <laughs> anyway i'll leave you guys to it do you, do you want any more tea or anything or... i'm fine thank you yeah okay yeah. i'll just go yeah. around <laughs> So, um, yes, it is. It's uh, everything is connected to each other. There is a, it's a circle. Uh, it's a sphere. Uh, there is not what is happening on the other side of the world will affect you here. And what happens here will affect the other side of the world, one way or the other. Whether it's done, uh, physically or whether it's done, uh, emotionally, uh, but it'll affect. It'll, it'll certainly have the effect across. But we, we, we still, as a, as a, as a community at large, global community, we still are finding it very difficult to make that shift in attitude to change. Um, you start mentioning words like alternatives and people say, Oh my God, you know, uh, excuse me. Uh, that's not the right word to use. And why not? Uh, well, it's, you know, the alternative culture and all that stuff starts to come to the mind. And, um, but that's the right word to use. It is an alternative. We have to find alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can't, business as usual is not acceptable anymore. At least not to us um, and to a, a lot of people. Because a lot of people are now saying that, look, I, I, my, my, uh, my land is disappearing. And um, um, it's the the Monsantos of this world who've taken over the whole hybrid uh, system are now under huge pressure to stop this because you can see the dust bowls in the United States uh, who've been for the last 10 years have been making a lot of uh, uh, money through the hybrid, but the soil, the soil is gone, it's finished. You can't, it's like a like the Great Depression again. It's, and you know, you see pictures of this. It's, kind of, it's evidence that it's not working. And, uh, I'm interested, particularly because I've been, uh, I, the, I'm actually going to have a, a screening of Food Inc. Uh, that, that looks at the practices of Monsanto in part, uh, where people aren't allowed to keep seed mm. from their crop and plant out the next mm. year. Uh, and even um, uh, machines that help sift seed. Uh, people who own these were run out of business. Um, of course, multinationals, big multinationals are starting to sue com uh, countries That's right. for loss of profit because right. they've just, you know, uh, like, like uh, I think the neonicotinoids have been killing bees. Right. So they, they've been banned and these com companies have sued countries for profit that they, they claim they would have got. Mm. Now, th this is an absurdity to me. Mm. What, what, what role do you think multinationals are playing in in the current state of affairs? Oh, they're playing a huge uh, role. And their role is just profit for today. It's not profit for tomorrow. Um, and, and, and that's a very general statement to make because there are some multinationals who are actually looking at the whole notion of uh, the effect that they can have. Um, I was the, uh, the past uh, president of the International Union of Conservation of Nature in Pakistan. 
So I was, uh, I, I had access to conferences, world conferences that I went to. And there was one example that was given to us about how the IUCN was able to persuade the Russian oil company to divert its oil line in Siberia because it was going to affect the environmental uh, aspects of uh, um, uh, preservation of the, the Tega, is it pronounced Tega or Tiger? Tega uh, in that particular part of Siberia. And Shell was a company, and Shell actually did that. It cost them much more to do that, but they removed the oil pipeline going right through the middle of it, and they turned, turned it to go all the way around. Now, sometimes Shell does uh, some very weird things, like they've been doing in Nigeria. Now, that's BP, I think. But these oil companies are, at the end of the day, Alex, an oil company is there to find oil. You know, that's their job. Uh, they're not there to to build solar panels, uh, though actually Shell and BP are doing that, just that very thing at the moment. But I suspect that that is to do with PR, to say to their, uh, their customers that, look, we also care for the environment. It is us who have to say that we don't want your oil, that we can survive without your oil. Uh, we don't need, uh, and it's happening, electric cars are now becoming more and more uh, prevalent. In China, I was there last year, in China, every single rickshaw and every single bus is electric. Um, and only very few cars, that they have, the cars are increasing. Uh, but the whole electric thing is becoming more and more popular. But then it leads to another situation. If you have to have electric cars, then you need electricity. And how do you have electricity? Is it coal-fired or is it, is it nuclear-powered or is it alternative systems? All of these things have to be considered dramatically. Now, I was talking to Aisha about this, you know, from some of the figures now, which is a long time away, but it's going to happen two to three hundred years from now. Um, what we see around us will be there, but you know, most of the time we'll be walking or on bicycles. We'll be, we'll have, we'll have very little use of private cars. Um, public transport will be more and more uh, increased. It has to be. Um, but see, it's what I'm really trying to do at this talk on the 29th is not to give facts and figures of what is happening in the world. I think there's enough around to know that. I mean, it'll just be very brief, but really the idea is to, to convince whoever comes there is that it's up to you to make the difference and you can make the difference in your own way. If you get together as a community, if you get together as an individual, you lobby your MPs, you lobby your, your people that you uh, who represent you. You may not have voted for them, but they represent you. Or they rep they rep that's what politics is about. Um, it, they can't, it, you know, if you have, what is it, how many people live in this country? 80 million? What is the population? Uh, I, I, I imagine around that. Uh, about yes. that? Mm. Um, even if you get half of that, saying to the government, sorry, we, we are not uh, interested in the the way that things are going at the moment because it's affecting our coastline, it's affecting my garden, it's affecting the plants that I eat, the vegetables I have, um, and I'm willing to forego a certain amount of those pleasures that I've been used to, not pleasures, that's not the word, uh, comforts that I've been used to, so that the bigger picture is is saved. So, so in my own life, uh, what what can you think that I can do? Uh, 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 something you said that stands out is uh, is it twenty gallons of water to produce a kilo of coffee? Yep. So uh, twenty tons, not gallons. Twi twenty tons, tons of water is taken to make one kilo of coffee, and this is. Figures given by Jeffrey Sachs, 
in his book uh, uh, and the poetry. So by s- stopping drinking coffee, uh, yes, in certainly in in maybe in my house, yes, uh, yes, and coffee is not good for you anyway. The caffeine is is uh, it's bad, bad for your system. But we've become addicted. I drink coffee. Uh, become addicted to tea, coffee. Um, so, yes, you. There are certain things that you can do yourself. We come just come from the Isle of Egg, and the Isle of Egg has said, "We don't want the mainland's electricity. We're going to produce our own," and that's what they've done. They've got solar, wind, and hydro that provides the whole island with their own electric power. And it was a community who got together to do that. Now, if Germany can produce 80% of its energy needs through solar energy, what do we, why can't we do it? Uh, sorry, why can't other countries in Europe do it? Uh, the simple reason that the Germans being Germans, they, they uh, are able to say they are more community minded or uh, conscious of that than perhaps British people are. I'm not saying Scottish, but I'm saying you know, British people. Um, China has been able to, is the one country that's been able to reduce its poverty by huge amounts, more than any other country, simply because China is not a democracy. China says, look, you have to do this. It gets done. And nobody says, argues that, no, I'm sorry, this is going to, it's not going to be the right thing to do or not. Um, the whole process of democracy is at stake that we know, and the democratic process is, is being eroded in front of our eyes. Um, more and more we are being held accountable by having our phones tapped and et cetera, et cetera. Um, th- through fear of, of, um, insecurity uh, and that fear aspect has been has been uh, worked on very well by the Americans you know they have this orange red uh, colors that tell them what so now they've got to a point where they just everything is, is paranoid <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah our society will change it has to change you and I may not change as much but our children will and their children will have to adapt more so to things. And they are, the young children, uh, uh, the young youngsters now are becoming more and more aware of what's been happening out in the world and why are frogs dying and why can't I uh, see my butterflies anymore. Mm-hmm. And they, they will be the ones that will. But what we need to do now is you and I at our age, uh, is to provide that uh, knowledge and that respite to the younger ones to say that, look, this is the way it has to be done. Uh, you know, if your carbon footprint is not reduced it, in the life that you live, in my house, my garden, on my roof, I grow my own vegetables. I have um, uh, a roof which is about four times the size of this room or three times the size of this room. And it's covered in pots. It's covered in um, in, 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 in uh, containers that I've made, which I grow all my vegetables. Um, everybody can do that. I mean, there's a there's a plot over here. This 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 car, the, this terrace over here. There, whoever lives or owns this terrace could easily grow their own vegetables. No problem whatsoever. As an architect, uh, it's, uh, it would be interesting to know about uh, your thoughts on greening the city. Mm. You know, there's all this vertical structures, and it, it's not very good for us. Uh, I, I believe there was some research showing that um, without the, the green environment, our cortisol levels go up, our stress mm. hormones. Mm increase mm. uh there's there's nothing to take pollution out of the air so the cancerous chemicals that come out of uh, 
exhaust fumes, for mm. example. Mm. I mean, it's not no small secret. It's mm. uh, mm. it's is a a glaring idiocy to <laughs> we're using combustion engines all through our cities. Mm. Um, and yeah, so so as an architect, I'm interested. How do we green our city practically? I think practically, um, practically, you provide incentives, like the Germans have done. If you provide, uh, if you do your house with solar power, you are given tax relief, and you're allowed to. When you're not using it, you're allowed to sell it back into the grid. So the incentive to green the city would be to grow your own vegetables, start your own bee farms. They're doing it in New York. You can do it here. Um, grow more flowers so that the bees have access to pollen or uh, to their uh, uh, to their nectar. Um, tree plantation. Well, actually, that is done by the government, not an individual. But if you look around, I mean, just out of this window. And down below here, but you can see a lot of flat roofs um, all, of, all the way around. Each one of these flat roofs could be growing their own vegetables, could be, uh, could be growing trees, could be growing shrubs that would uh, uh, provide further oxygen into the atmosphere. Um, it would also be a great insulin to uh, prevent uh, excessive heat gain or excessive coldness at night to do that. Um, the whole uh, idea of allotments that used to be the early part of the 19th century and well, the middle part of the 19th century, after the war, 50s, 60s. Land is now becoming very valuable, so... Yeah? Hydroponics, even if you didn't have land, you could use hydroponics as a system. I've seen it working very well. Plastic pipes, water running through them. Um, and you provide the nutrients at one end. And I've seen tomatoes this big. It's coming out of a little hole in a pipe, diameter of that size. Nice. Yeah, hydroponics is a great, uh, great, uh, a great thing. Something I wanted to ask you because there's there's mixed feeling uh, and mixed perspectives on uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Indeed, uh, uh, I I met somebody who, who uh, violently reacted, you know, or verbally reacted to 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 the World Bank. I don't know that much about them. But their their opinion was such that the World Bank is is much more uh, about constraining economies than, than helping them. Uh, well, well, tell tell me about your experience with the World Bank and the activities that that is. Yeah, um, the World Bank has been very good with us. Right. Uh, they have never restrained us in any, in fact, they've encouraged us to, to do certain things in different ways. And when they have found that we are doing it in different ways, they've encouraged us further. Uh, and I'm talking about specifically our work that we're doing through our NGO in, in uh, Pakistan. When you look at the bigger picture, when you look at the World Bank encouraging or used to encourage, I don't think it does anymore. It used to encourage building huge dams because the dams, like the Aswan Dam, for argument's sake, uh, which has proved to be an environmental disaster, um, wasn't the World Bank wasn't seeing it from that point of view. What they were seeing was it would provide hydroelectricity uh, for a population that is growing. It would provide a reservoir of water and where that water could be channeled off for irrigation purposes. Uh, it wasn't uh, looking at a picture where you could say that uh, it would eventually be more damaging than uh, profitable for that country concerned. 
Uh, and that's to do, and this is the argument that people put forward. And quite honestly, I'm I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not in a position to argue that or not argue that because I don't know enough. Um, but when it comes to the bigger picture, World Bank and the IMF um, have have certainly got a lot of things to answer for from the point of view of um, doing it in a way where certain countries can't afford to do it the way that they wanted to have, have, it, uh, have it done. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, personal experience of the World Bank has been fine. Good. I'm not, you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't complain. And you also mentioned uh, use of alternative energy uh, technologies, so solar power, creating creation of solar power panels, and and uh, at one point you mentioned wind. Yes. Uh, yeah. Wind turbine. So uh, are are these accessible? Are these realistic technologies? Yes, um, I I learned a lot from uh, uh, an organisation that is on uh, in Scotland in um, the Orkneys. Orkneys, yes. Um, now, what is it called? Uh, and they had they had an office in Edinburgh. It'll just come to me in a minute. Um, where they were teaching you how to make a wind turbine. They taught you how to make a wind turbine, and. Um, It's called NORAG. NORAG Technologies. And uh, it's run by a Scots person who's been going for many years as part of the Alternative Technology Development Group, Schumacher's. Um, and um, uh, we learned from that how they made it. They gave us the full set of drawings, etc. So we're teaching people how to make um, uh, wind turbines out of truck parts, using truck parts. Um, the only thing that we can't provide them with is magnets, because magnets are, are imported mostly from Japan or China. But everything else is, is locally made. Uh, just go, and go to a junkyard and collect it and we'll show you how to make a wind turbine. Now, when it comes to solar systems, what happens is that the in the Chinese factories, if a solar panel, a solar cell, which is about this size, gets slightly damaged, you know, it's broken off of the edges or anything else. It's all of this put into containers and it's sold to the developing world because it's very cheap. So we buy these and we assemble it. So the, 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 the units are put together and they're soldered together so that the energy comes through. And we show, we show that to people how to make Make your solar system. Fantastic. Um, they can have enough light for a room about this size with one bulb, two bulbs, maybe one bulb will do it in this size. Yeah. And it lasts about eight hours. And it's a you know, it's a it's a car battery that you use to store the energy overnight. Um, would you uh, just finally would you describe your work as education for sustainability in any sense? Absolutely. Right. Completely. I mean, we, we, we train people. We train people how to make this. We don't make it and give it to them. We'll show you how to make this. And it'll take a bit of time to show you how to make it. And it'll cost more than it would be if it was just taken out of a factory. By the end of the day, you will know how to make it. You will have a trade and you will have a business. And you will have a lot of dignity because you uh, are now making things yourself. Uh, you're earning your own money. Nobody's giving you a handout. And uh, at the end of the day, it's the only way in my view is that you have to train people to learn to stand on their own feet and they can do it. The poor in Pakistan, and I suspect in many other countries, are born entrepreneurs. They just need the opportunity to be able to fulfill that role. 
uh, nobody's going to give them a job because they're uneducated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for them to survive, they have to make their own way. And they, they I mean, the, the, uh, the, so 1,250 people, they, they've surprised me as to their uh, enterprise, as to their enthusiasm, um, and it's all to do with dignity. They're getting dignity now. You know, they're doing it themselves. Um, no more handouts. And it's sustained because, yeah. you know, you, 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 you own it. Your, your, the ownership is yours. You have an ownership and you sustain it. You build a house with your own hands. You're going to make damn sure that the house doesn't collapse. <laughs> I can assure you. Because <laughs> it's hard work. Are there bureau, uh, bureaucratic barriers for... Oh, for, yes. Uh, yes. Always. Right. Right. The uh, uh, local uh, politicians that are getting jealous of our work uh, because we are doing what should have been done by them. But because they're so corrupt, they're sitting back in the air-conditioned offices, not doing it. And since we're doing it, there is one community, it's a Hindu community. Um, I should have been to it. These people uh, are so... Uh, enthusiastic to improve their lot, uh, that all of a sudden the landlord came around and started to talk to us to say, look, what you're doing is, is, is not right from my point of view. So what do you mean from your point of view? So because the more they get uh, empowered, the more they will demand their rights. And said, so, yes, that's, that's part of the constitution. He says, no, it's not part of my constitution. Uh, and please, can you restrain yourself from uh, giving them more empowerment? Now, the, one of the empowerments that we do is we teach them the constitutional human rights, what they have, or what they should know. It's part of the law. And they've never heard of it. They've never, they didn't even know it existed. So now they're going to see their landlord and saying, you know, we need, we, we want this and that you should be providing. So he's getting pissed off with us. And even the local politicians are getting jealous of and they're putting obstacles in our way. We have to get no objection certificates for everything that we do. So some of them are not giving it to us. They said, sorry. So yes, bureau, bureaucrats getting in the way. But, you know, we, I'll give an example, Alex, of, of uh, how powerful a community can be. We were doing a, a, a project in a village. And the project was to build um, flood protection walls. It was prone to floods. And it was a substantial, a lot of money was involved. So I decided that put your money where your mouth is. I said, what we're going to do is all the money that we get from the donor, we're going to give it to the community. We're not going to do this. They're going to do it. And the donor went ape shit. They said, you know what? They're not going to do this. They're going to do that. And they're going to run away with the money. Other NGOs saying you're mad, etc." Anyway, we finally convinced them. We went ahead and did it. The community built these uh, uh, walls, this uh, flood protection walls, better than any other contractor would have done. And they, they, they were able to handle the money. They did everything. At the end of the project, the, 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 we have a selection process. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, when we set up a community-based organization, we also set up village development organization. These are all elected by the community themselves. So the, the, and there is always a president, a treasurer, and a secretary. Uh, the three of us, the three of them came to us and he said, you know, for the first time in our lives, somebody has trusted us. And we were able to do this. And I said, you know, you will, your politicians came around and they said, we've not seen work like this. For the simple reason that a political entity given the same amount of money. Another example I'll give you were, uh, uh, were, was to build check dams, which is check dams is built along the river. And they're small dams with irrigation channels so that the water flows from one dam to, to the next. You're allowed to do that. 
it's on a slope. Then we're going to build two out of the money. So let's say it was 10 pounds. Then we're going to build two. We built nine out of 10 pounds. And all the, the, the politicians got pissed off with us because their cut, their corruption cut was completely taken away. They made no money. Previously, if they'd done that, they would have made money from seven dams that never been built, but the community would have thought at least we have two. Corruption is, is a cancer which is, which affects the bureaucrats, bureaucrats. Uh, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm getting tired of it now. You know, I, I find it very difficult to cope with because I, I lose my temper. So I, you know, I just put other people in front of I, I, I'm sure I'll say one thing one day, which is not going to be taken down very well at all. <laughs> I can't stand these people. We are just driving us. When you see, you can see the possibility of doing things and it's just being held back because of your greed. Hmm. So that's really at the end of the day, what uh, a paradigm shift is going to be, has to be, and it'll happen. Unfortunately, it'll happen. I'm, I was about to say when it's too late, because it's not a meteor that's hitting the planet and everything gets wiped out in a few seconds. This is, this is taking its very slow, gradual process. And then if we go over the two degree mark, uh, it's, you can't bring it back. You can't bring it back to one degree or anything. It's gone. Which means that at the end of the day, it could mean to three and a half to four degree, uh, which will mean that a lot of the uh, cities by the coast will, will have gone, will disappear. And I think Obama is beginning to understand that, though his uh, Republicans are not allowing him to do what he needs to do. Because I think they've now realized that Florida will just disappear in the next 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So reality bites. Yeah, we don't have to go to see movies anymore. <laughs> or disasters, we'll just be in it. <laughs> yeah. But as I was saying to Aisha once, or the other day, there's, all, there's still time. Yeah. There's time to change that. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not a go, it's a not a foregone conclusion. There's time. And then time means, you know, another five, six, ten years. If we make the right decisions, the politicians make the right decision. If they're lobbied by, you have a democracy here. If you, well, let's, um, Aisha has different views. Yes, Aisha has different views on that word. But I mean, <laughs> um, even that, even that, if millions of people rose and said, sorry, we, you know, we, we know we don't accept your, your policy anymore because it's, 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 it's killing off my ecosystem, my ecosystem, because I, I, as an individual depend on that ecosystem. If my bees are not going to be there, eventually it's going to affect me. If the flowers are not there and the butterflies are not there, eventually it's going to affect me. Uh, and it will. Mm. There is enough evidence to say that it will. This is not uh, scaremongering anymore. It's, it's a fact. It's a truth. So it, there is time to prevent all this from happening. I'm always positive uh, about uh, how things... Look, you have a university where you, you uh, allow people to talk about things that normally are not discussed. Uh, people come to listen to that. There may be 10, 20, 30, whatever it is, number of people, hundreds maybe. Um, it's, a, it's a start. You've been doing it since 1870. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, well, that's great. That's great. I believe, I believe in change and I believe that it starts with us and you're doing fantastic work and you're an inspiration. I'm looking forward to learning a, a whole heap lot of uh, new strategies from you. Well, you know, whatever it is that I can offer, obviously it's there to be shared. Um, well, thank you very much. No, Alex, it's great Shahid. to talk to you and thank you for coming. <laughs> and taking your time from Glasgow and running up here.
That's so true. Oh. Well, uh, you know, it's one day at a time and we yeah. get to the top of the mountain. One day we'll look out and go, <laughs> what a beautiful sight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great uh, way to look at it. Yeah. So, 